Hey everyone, Blue Goblin here. Thank you for joining me here on my Blue Goblin X channel for the newest, for this Midtown Comics stash. Uh, I got another pile of books here for this video to talk about, courtesy of my bro, my student, my friend, Chris, the Mount Vernon kid, and of course from Midtown Comics. Uh, let's go ahead and get started with this one. We're going to start off with a uh, th three issues of... Uh, from Moonstone, we got three issues of Sheena, Queen of the Jungle. Uh, it's uh, done by the same David DeSouza, the same writer of Die Hard. Uh, it was nice to see uh, somebody else take a stab at Sheena. You know, because you know, growing up, the only Sheena I ever knew was from Marvel. And it's good for an independent company to give their take on, on Sheena. And I thought this, uh, the, these three issues were done very well uh, with some uh, great covers. I, I particularly love this cover right here. It's just, it just reeks of, aw, shit. And uh, this one was kind of creepy, but not bad. Uh, but so far, you know, I actually really, really like this. Uh, she's, you know, the queen of, her, queen of the jungle, yet she also has a you know, civilian alter ego and everything. And, you know, the way she's trying to keep her identity secret, it just happens to be due to plot conveniences and shit like that. Um, it all deals with um, massacres going on in the jungle, and it ends up being caused by by men who are been given this mysterious curse slash gift of transforming into cheetah men. And I know somebody's going to mention cheetah men for the NES, uh, but all in all, this these three issues were damn good. Written very well, good action. What what action we got in here, and the pacing wasn't too slow. Yet I thought it could have been done a little. The pacing could have been done a little bit better, but I liked it. Thought it was very well done, and Moonstone did a good job. It's nice to see other people give their take on Sheena. All right, moving on to. Uh, Dynamite. This is issue one of Sherlock Holmes versus Harry Houdini. God damn. This took me by surprise. I thought I thought this was gonna be eh. But here you got two brilliant minds coming together and they're not friends. Man, this was a good start to this series. You got Harry Houdini, who's portrayed as a very douchey, arrogant prick. But he's brilliant. And then you got Sherlock Holmes, who's reeling off of drug addiction and everything. That's just how it's presented in here. Yet he's still got that brilliant mind who's able to deduce anything, anytime, anywhere. And I mean, you got these two arrogant yet brilliant minds clashing. And it's like, it's like the material just writes itself. It's just so well done, so well handled. And this issue ends on a bitchin' cliffhanger that just made me want more, and I got more, but I'll review the I'll review the second issue in in uh, in another video. But this was amazing, very well done. Uh, Anthony Del, Del Cole, and Connor McCree, and Carlos uh, Furizono, everybody who worked on this, fantastic start to a, what I'm hoping will be a great series from Dynamite. This was awesome. All right, let's go to DC Comics with Deathstroke number one. Um, wow, uh, this was interesting. This was interesting. You got Deathstroke. I I didn't get the I didn't get the original Deathstroke run from when the New Fifty Two started because it just didn't just didn't look like my Deathstroke. I always. When I think of Deathstroke, I think of the classic vigilante character that was created by Wolfman and Perez back in the early 80s, leading up to, you know, the, the pre-52 Deathstroke was my Deathstroke. I saw Deathstroke in the new 52 ads and everything, and I was like, I just like, I just wasn't feeling it, and I guess it just it didn't last very long, and then we get to this. Um... I applaud Chris for sending me this because this was actually pretty good. Tony Daniel does his best work with this, does the best he can with this, I would imagine. Um, you know, Deathstroke is uh, doing a job, and 
Oh my god. Let's just say... Let's just say something happens to, to Slade. Let's just say that. Something really bad. And I mean really bad. Happens to Slade. Let's just say that to the point where he needs corrective surgery to to survive it. But uh, I know I'm minorly spoiling this, but at the end of the by the end of the issue, the cliffhanger reveals the new Slade Wilson, if you will. Slade looks absolutely nothing like he should, and he's pissed. He is pissed. Uh, because he's basically got a whole new look. He's he's just a completely new person by the end of the issue. I'm not too sure if I completely agree with that, but it is an interesting plot twist. It is an interesting cliffhanger. It's leaving me wanting more, yet at the same time, I'm not 100% fond of changing Deathstroke's appearance 100%. He has both eyes again. He looks younger. It, it just... It just doesn't look like Slade Wilson. Who knows? This could lead to something good. I, I'm going to keep an open mind. This was good, though. Then we're going on to Marvel. We're going on to uh, Life After Logan. This surprised me. This surprised me and impressed me by how good it was. You got three separate stories of particular X-Men dealing with Wolverine's loss. First, we look at Dick Summers. Cyclops, and how he copes with Logan's death. I was a, um, I was a bit surprised on how he took Logan's death. He took it as you know, the way he remembers Logan, and he smiles about it. You know, he's not, he's not happy Logan's dead. Of course he's not. You know, you can say all you want to about Dick Summers. He is a fucking dick. But. At least he respects Logan enough to acknowledge that it does sadden him to know that Logan is gone. But I liked how I actually liked how he chose to to remember Logan, and I thought it was really well handled. Then the next, the second story was with uh, Nightcrawler and Colossus. It was fun. It was cute for what it was, and you know, of course, you got to have a fastball special in there. So there's your wink and nod to Logan. But surprisingly, the best story told in here was. Uh, Misako's armors, her story, awesome, fantastic. She said Logan was outside of my actual family, the the only family I really had around here. I've she says she's experienced death before, but this is the first time in a long time where she actually felt it, and it really affected her. It seems like out of all the people affected by Logan's death in this story, it felt like Armor was affected the hardest. And she had an emotional breakdown, you know, the more she thought about it, and I thought it was so well written, so well told. It was great. This was a fun and fascinating one shot. I fucking loved it. Thank you again, Chris. This was great. Then now we're gonna stick we're gonna stick with Marvel. And uh, talk about issues one through four of Storm. <sighs> wow. Uh, Greg Pot wrote these four issues. God damn. How incredible were these? These were amazing. The first issue deals with Storm going back to an old territory that she was familiar with as a child and everything. And some anti-mutant shit happens and she deals with it in her own way, much to Hank's dismay. And then issue two leads her to an old buddy, Callisto. <laughs> uh, and there, this second issue is basically one big misunderstanding and Storm's accepting of it and respecting it. And I thought it was really well done, character development-wise. And then uh, the third issue deals with... Uh, ha she has an ordeal and she ends up working with Forge. And I really love this particular issue uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, but I'll try to sum it up as best I can. Storm and Forge in this issue. Storm acknowledges she doesn't want to be friends with Forge. 
because Forge is no angel. In fact, let's 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 just say how it is. Forge is an asshole. It's been shown time and time again that he's a fucking asshole sometimes. Of course, Storm's no angel herself, but she's made it perfectly blunt. She doesn't care. She doesn't want to be friends with Forge because she honestly feels like he hasn't earned it. He hasn't. He doesn't deserve it. But Storm is actually willing to be the bigger person and admit that she can try. And I love how she gives the ultimatum to Forge. If you want my friendship, there's a certain way you have to earn it. And I love how she put it and everything. This was really good. Really, really well done. And the fourth issue is how she dealt with Logan's death. And this is probably one of the largest and most... This is probably one of the most brilliant outbursts of emotion that I have seen in a long, long time. Just amazing. Just fucking amazing. I loved all four of these issues. And leave it to Chris to send me these books knowing what I fucking missed out on down here. <sighs> Oh my god. This was this was incredible. Greg Pock did a phenomenal job with all four of these books. Do yourselves a favor. It's not too late. If you can find them at your local comic book shop, or if you want to wait until they come out and trade, pick up this story. Pick up this series. So far, the first four issues, damn awesome. But we're ending this video with... Boom Studios, we got RoboCop number five. Awesome. Simply awesome. Basically, we now have RoboCop with a bit of a at a bit of a disadvantage because issue four ended with the jaw-dropping statement that now RoboCop's firearm has been taken away from him, and he now has to patrol the streets and serve and protect with just a club. He's basically unarmed. No firearm. He's got to do things the old-fashioned way with either his club or with some old-fashioned justice. You know what I'm saying? And it puts him at a really disadvantage, giving him an underdog factor that really helps develop the character and push the character further. I fucking love this. This was good. And we get some more dastardly shit from Killian, but I really love the attention to detail and just how much of a at a disadvantage RoboCop is at, yet at the same time, you know, he's not going to show any outbursts of emotion because he's a fucking robot. He's going to continue to follow his programming and do his damn job despite how much, how much he's been disabled by not having his firepower. Really, really well executed. Really brilliantly written. Great action. I mean, this is just as good as the first four issues have been. Fucking awesome. I loved it. Thank you again, Chris. Thank you again, Boom Studios. And thank you again, Midtown Comics. This was incredibly done. I loved it. Well, that's all I got for this particular video, everyone. I want to thank you all for watching. And why am I talking like this? I do not know. Well, <laughs> uh, more to come, hopefully. I uh, know I got another one coming up very shortly. Uh, stay tuned for that. Please subscribe to Blue Goblin X. Don't forget Blue Goblin Zero One. Uh, remember, follow me on Twitter at Blue Goblin Zero One. Look for me on Tumblr and Pinterest. Give my bro, the Mount Vernon kid, some love. Subscribe to all his channels, and you won't regret it. I promise. Don't forget my old buddies, Deadpool Zilla and Brandon Hex. Me and my girlfriend Jennifer at Arkham Asylum Studio. Uh, thanks again for watching, everybody. I'll see y'all later.